Micah is addressing, we'll, we'll call it the leaders, but it trickles all the way down. When you think about it, when people are walking around now talking about subjects that for decades now we've, ha we've grappled with, we've had issues with, but instead of talking about them in a way that looks back to God's word or at least looks to some foundational pillars of, if you want to call it the Judeo-Christian way, we're looking to homogenize and please everybody because God forbid we should piss somebody off by saying, this is the way, walk ye in it. God forbid there should be an act of discipline on God's part and there will be one. That is what is coming up. We are back in the book of Micah again in this very, what will be a short series. Um, last week we were looking at chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. I kind of titled that section, Niawa versus the people, in a style reminiscent of a legal proceeding perhaps brought against the people by God for their sinfulness. And a brief kind of strange and foreign response comes towards the end of those verses, um, followed by verse 8 which basically is what, in a nutshell, God requires. And I cannot reiterate this enough because we see it in this day and age and I don't know when I will have another chance to weave this in just like this. But God is not looking for the outward ceremony and the pomp and the circumstance. In fact, God does not care about any of that. The first thing that God cares about goes back to a question that's probably been asked here for several decades. What do you want from your loved ones, from your husband, your wife, your children? Perfection or trust? Trust. It can't be perfect. No one's perfect except for him. And that is what God is still looking for, people to trust him. So it's the very thing that he didn't get from the beginning with Adam and Eve, and it goes straight on through to the time of Micah, clear through to this day and age that we live in. And we spend too much time. I've been criticized over the years, well, you don't do this in the church, and you don't do that. Because those are the people who are conditioned to, like Pavlov's dog, outward performance. There must be certain things that go along with church because that's what we've been brainwashed with. But with God, not so. And my template and my proof, 1 Samuel 16, 7, when it says that God, man looks upon the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart, that is what counts to him. That's what matters. So when I say this, first half of what we looked at last week. It's a little disturbing, especially the response um, of the people answering, wh whoever the individual was that answered back. You know, well, will God be pleased if I should offer up everything, tons and lots of this, and like as if God should be appeased somehow, or that God can be bought. But that brings us right into the concept of what was happening right then and there in the city. So today we're looking at verses 9 through 16 of the sixth chapter of the book of Micah. I'm going to read first for those who don't have a Bible who are listening. And this might be entitled Crime and Punishment. The Lord's voice crieth unto the city, and the man of wisdom shall see thy name Hear ye the rod, and who hath appointed it? Are there yet the treasures of wickedness in the house of the wicked, and the scant measure that is abominable? Shall I count them pure with the wicked balances and with the bag of deceitful weights? For the rich men thereof are full of violence, and the inhabitants thereof have spoken lies, and their tongue is deceitful in their mouth. Therefore also will I make thee sick in smiting thee, in making thee desolate because of thy sins. Thou shalt not eat, thou shalt eat, but not be satisfied, and thy casting down shall be in the midst of thee, and thou shalt take hold 
but shall not deliver. And that which thou deliverest will I give up to the sword. Thou shalt sow, but thou shalt not reap. Thou shalt tread the olives, but thou shalt not anoint thee with oil and sweet wine, but shalt not drink wine. For the statutes of Omri are kept in all the works of the house of Ahab. And ye walk in their counsels, that I should make thee a desolation, and the inhabitants thereof an hissing. Therefore ye shall bear the reproach of my people. Now, remember I said to you last week, the door for the people to amend their ways had opened. But it's almost as though the prophet, actually God through the prophet, says, not done yet. Like, here's the door for you to basically amend your ways. No, nope, not done yet. I, I have more to say. And I can relate to that because sometimes when you're so moved with something inside, you just can't leave it alone. You ever been there like that? You just can't leave it be? So just as quickly as, we'll say, the door opens, the door shuts. And this verse 9, the Lord's voice crieth unto the city. I want you to think of that's a different way of saying here is basically God through the prophet Micah speaking. And very carefully when it says, and the man of wisdom shall see thy name. The problem here, the scripture says the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. Here the people had no wisdom and they obviously had no fear. So if you look carefully, it says, the man of wisdom, which is in italics, if you read the margin, thy name shall see that which is, which it's very, very hard, even for someone like me, to make sense of a lot of the uh, kind of jerky style of writing. But if you want to sift it away, I'll tell you this. When it says, hear ye the rod, and who hath appointed it? The rod is judgment, and who hath appointed it? God. So basically, listen up, folks. Prophet is speaking, and I'm not done now. And before I call the mountains and the hills to witness, now I'm coming into the city, and I'm going to talk to you just as plain as day. Let's leave the allegory right now, and let's just go where the rubber meets the road, so to speak. So the rod, judgment, and who hath appointed it? God. I want you to notice that three times in two verses you have the word wickedness, wicked, and wicked. He says, are there yet the treasures of wickedness in the house of the wicked and the scant measure that is abominable? Shall I count them pure with the wicked balances and with the bag of deceitful weights? Now, I want to explain a little bit of this, but let me just say the people who are being addressed here, and believe it or not, because you can read kind of clearly in this part, He's talking to government officials, commercial folks, people dealing in business, and religious leaders. They're all being addressed. And although this section is very brief, you get the sense when you read it that if Micah could start naming names, it would be like he's almost on the cusp of saying, and so-and-so, and so-and-so. And so. That's how much power is in what he's saying. Um, so you have corrupt business people. And what's interesting is, and that's why I said I'm going to read from the NIV, which makes it crystal clear. It's interesting that back there in Leviticus, you know, sometimes you read things and you say, why did God even spell this out, right? Why did God put something there which seems so obvious? But back in Levitic, Leviticus, uh, where we know most of the laws of the offerings and how basically it's, Leviticus is a book basically spelling out all the different practices and procedures that must be performed under the law. And within the book of Leviticus, there are two interesting verses. Do not use dishonest standards when measuring length, weight, or quantity. Use honest scales and honest weights and honest ephah and an honest hint. Basically, that's a way of saying don't defraud people. So... When Micah's calling out these um, scant measure that is abominable, shall I count them pure with the wicked balances and the bag of deceitful weights, it would be like saying something like this, maybe a larger weight for the seller so he received uh, less for more, or if you want to put it the other way, basically how to cheat people and still make lots of money. 
Well, basically that goes on today, I guess, all day long. So there's nothing new that the ancients haven't stolen here. But the point is that this type of practice was not only defrauding the people, the individuals, but it was also robbing God. Because if you, if you figure out what the prophet is basically looking at, it goes on to say, For the rich men thereof are full of violence, and the inhabitants thereof have spoken lies, and their tongue is deceitful in their mouth. So what we have here, basically, verse 9 is the address, 10 through 12 is the accusation, 13 through 15 is sentence and condemnation, and 16 is somewhat of a recap in a very strange way, and I'll elaborate in a minute. Now we know that Jerusalem was the epicenter of trade, commerce. Vast fortunes could be made honestly. Okay, You're talking about a place that people flooded into several times a year for pilgrimages, set times for feast and days where basically people would come from faraway lands to come into the city. So we know that while there could be crooked people at any time, even innocent people were being ripped off. These merchants eager to overcharge or rip off the ignorant and innocent tourist. See, nothing changes, right? That still happens today. Go to, go to a place somewhere, People say, where should I go? And they point you in a direction. It's a tourist trap, right? It's uh, $50 for a cappuccino to sit in a table in a square somewhere. And now you've been really had because that coffee is about 50 cents and the table costs nothing. Kind of that same concept. But you see what he's going to be calling out. Rich men thereof are full of violence. Basically, if you look at what he's saying, he doesn't say here, that money is evil or commerce is evil, but we know through the Bible, the love of money is evil and goes back to the root of several things. And you can't serve God and mammon. So remember, this is all about people departing from God's ways and being more, um, more enamored and more affected by the almighty dollar than by serving God and being a law-abiding citizen, if you will. So... There are five disasters in this passage linked to directly or indirectly to commerce and the marketplace. And what's interesting is that you've heard the expression from farm to table. Well, all of what's going to happen will affect from farm to table and beyond when these things like thou shalt eat and not be satisfied, all of these will affect everyone from start to finish. And if you think these are unjust or unfair, way back there, again, very reminiscent of what God said in Deuteronomy 28. You remember God in Deuteronomy 28 gave blessings for obedience and curses for disobedience. And I'll read you a little bit of what's said in Deuteronomy 28, because remember, at the end of all this and at the bottom of all this, is basically a concept desiring the people to turn back to God and God's ways. You can trace everything back essentially to the genesis of this. Deuteronomy 28, and I'll read it for you. I'm reading from the NIV. However, however, if you do not obey the Lord your God and do not carefully follow all his commandments and decrees I am giving you today, all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. You will be cursed in the city and cursed in the country. Your basket and your kneading trough will be cursed. The fruit of your womb will be cursed. The crops of your land, the calves of your herd, the lambs of your flocks, you will be cursed when you come in and cursed when you go out. Everywhere. It goes on. But reading what is being said in Micah, it's not as though Micah just invented this. This is God speaking through the prophet and God has not changed his ways. The Lord will send on you curses, confusion, and rebuke in everything you put your hand to until you are destroyed and come to sudden ruin because of the evil you have done in forsaking him. The Lord will plague you with diseases until he has destroyed you from the land you are entering to possess. The Lord will strike you with wasting disease, with fever, with inflammation, with scorching heat and drought, with blight, mildew, which will plague you 
until you perish. Now, you know, if I was first hearing this, as Moses was delivering it to the children of Israel, I'd be, I'd be listening because I already, I already would have seen the hand of God and all the miracles performed, and I would have said, God is God, and I'm going to pay attention. The Lord will turn the rain of your country into dust and powder. It will come down from the skies until you are destroyed. The Lord will cause you to, to, you to be defeated before your enemies. You will come at them from one direction, but flee from them in seven. You will become a thing of horror to all the kingdoms on the earth. Your carcasses will be food for all the birds of the air and all the beasts of the earth, and there will be no one to frighten them away. The Lord will afflict you with the boils of Egypt and with tumors, festering sores, and the itch from which you cannot be cured. And it goes on. I mean, it's very, it's kind of very dreadful. So... When Micah says, you're going to eat and not be satisfied, let me read it to you from the NIV so you can kind of hear it in plain English. When he says, you will eat but not be satisfied. Your stomach will still be empty. You will store up but save nothing because what you save I will give to the sword. You will plant but not harvest. You will press olives but not use the oil on yourselves. You will crush grapes, but not drink the wine. So you can kind of see there's a big parallel here. And the attempt, if you will, it's gloom and doom. Yes, it's a terrible thing upon the people, but imagine if you were the prophet trying to turn the people back. And this is, kind of reminds me of a little incident that happened um, if some of you listen or watch current affairs. As I mentioned last week that because of Speaker Pelosi's stance on abortion, the Catholic Church has denied her uh, the right to take communion, which I don't agree with the way communion is administered or even handled within the Catholic Church. But some talking head on some TV show basically said that the church has no right to do this, no right at all. Well, listen, friend, talking dummy, uh, if you don't know that the intent of blocking someone, even though I don't agree with the methodology or the theological understanding of communion, the premise is to turn someone back to God, to make them sorrowful for their behavior or come to a reality that their acts are not within line with God's ways. It's not some, um, I will lord it over the people. It's an attempt to turn somebody back. This is why when people are excommunicated, the design is that it would bring such terror in the heart of a person because they love God so much, and especially in the dark ages, uh, where if you were excommunicated, you were basically cut off from every form because people didn't possess Bibles on their own. You were dependent upon the priesthood. So there's a whole litany here of reasons of why the prophet would, through God, pronounce these things upon the people. And don't think it's simply because he was sadistic or mean. Here's an attempt, maybe a last-ditch effort, to get the people to turn back. And don't think that he's the only one that did that. You've got Amos did the same thing in Samaria. You've got the same words coming from the prophet Haggai. You've sown so much and you bring little. You've eaten, but you don't have enough. You drink, but you're not filled. You clothe yourself, but none is warm. He that earneth wages, earneth wages put into a bag with holes. Most of the prophets spoke like this to try and turn the people back. Now, for us, that may be a foreign thing because we're now used to coddling people, and there is no such thing as discipline. To discipline... In this day and age, discipline's a dirty word. You can't discipline your child. You realize, I'm not even sure how the army functions anymore. The army used to function on discipline. I'm not even sure how that works anymore. Are there people that have become so uh, enamored with the way things are today that, God forbid, you should, you should be disciplined? Oh, I have to sue now. I have to complain. I've got to do something. The people here are being indicted for their behavior. And don't think, although I will say this, 
um, Micah sounds uh, just a little bit like Elijah in making it sound like there's no, there's no one in the city left that is good. Remember how Elijah said, basically lamenting to God, there's no one, and God said, I'll show you those thousands that haven't bowed their knee to Baal yet, right? So Micah sounds a little bit like that, but I don't blame him because even if I put this in today's speak, where the rubber meets the road today, I don't see very many people fighting for this book or fighting for their rights to whatever your faith is, whatever it is you want to practice in this land of freedom, to fight for it. And that's basically, in a nutshell, what's happening here through the prophet. He's saying, if you can even understand, turn back. But he's not saying it in a way that would be receptive or received by all, I'm sure. So I want you to think about what he's saying here in these verses 14 through 15. We're talking about grain, oil, and wine, as well as uh, the ability to make money, to live. So we're talking about the impact that this would have not just on the religious community, but daily living. Everyone will be affected by this. And if you think about it, for example, you shall eat but not be satisfied, um, or you, what you basically sow, you won't reap. I can only imagine, remember, they're going to be carried off. That's their ultimate fate. And this warning would have been to say, wake up before it's too late. And maybe if some turned around and gave God the credit and started realizing they had departed from God's ways. But you go back to the answer of the person uh, in verses 6 and 7, and it gives you an idea of just how far the mindset was from God. Wherewith shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? It sounds a little bit like someone who is actually ridiculing God. This is all just but a joke. And I wonder how many can see the connection to today, that a lot of people just think this is just a joke, the church is a joke. Well, it's been made a mockery by, first by those in the pulpit who have abused it, and basically in every realm, and I speak only of Christians now and, and Christendom, and that's unfortunate, it's a black mark. But for those of us who are serious about God, can you imagine somebody, and I see this, I hate to tell you, on a regular basis, people who just think the church is a joke. It's just a big joke. And even more so because we don't worship like some other churches do. We're not bowing down at some altar and kissing the foot of some statue or doing some ritual behavior and handing out round wafers that somehow we don't fit the mold. Well, I got news for you. Jesus didn't fit the mold either. If you really read what he was about he is not the person that most people think he is when they have this cookie-cutter religion. Not at all. Or the Jesus that would always be this fluffy, kind person. No, well, he was fluffy and kind while he was throwing the money changers out of the temple, right? That's fluffy and kind Jesus. So if you understand what this would entail, we're talking about the livelihood and the lives of all within the city. Don't just think about bed, bread that was baked to be sold. Think about the fact that those who sowed the seed to bake the bread eventually and the oil that was needed, none of it would be yielded. None of it would come. So basically we have a curse on the city that would cripple it. And this crippling, by the way, would come before the carrying away. That's kind of the tragedy of this all. You get down to the last, um, the last verse. And the statutes of Omri are kept in all the works of the house of Ahab, and you walk in their counsels that I should make thee a desolation. You know, we might not really understand at the first in reading that. It sounds like an afterthought just tacked on the end, but it's not. Because you go back and you read in 1 Kings 16.25, what Omri did was evil in the sight of the Lord. And if you think he was evil, his son Ahab comes after him, and he's infinitely even more wicked and more evil 
than what came before. Now, I need to explain this, especially for those who are not familiar with all that this verse 16 means, and then we can kind of make a little bit more of a summary of all this. We know that when Omri died, Ahab becomes king and he reigned, and as I said, he did even more evil. And we know that Ahab married Jezebel, the daughter of Ithbaal, king of the Sidonians. Now, if you, I'm, I'm going to read a little bit of this to give some background, but we'll say like father, like son, but even worse and on steroids bad, all right? Uh, Omri was the founder of the hill that he bought for two talents of silver called Shemer that he ultimately named Samaria and took a lot of his uh, ideology from Jeroboam. So you, all roads kind of trace back to the beginning. If you remember, I showed you a list of the kings that when if you recall, Solomon, who had basically uh, been lured away from following God and followed false gods because of the many wives and concubines that he had, and it was told to him that the kingdom would be split apart, but for his father's sake, God would not, for his father David's sake, God would not do that until Solomon died. When Solomon died, the kingdoms were split apart, and you've got the very beginning of the evil, if you will, with Jeroboam, who basically put idols at Dan and Bethel and tried to basically prevent the people from going to worship in Jerusalem. It's too far for you, and these are much more convenient. And why do you need to talk to God when you have it? Convenience, friends. It's all here. You know, it's like, listen, I hate to say this because I sound like I have a one-track mind, but you can see how perverse sometimes convenience can be. We'll make it convenient. You don't even need to carry cash anymore. All you need is your little card, and you won't need a card anymore. Because we'll just implant it in your arm and your forehead, and then you won't need to carry anything. Isn't that convenient? Isn't that a great idea, right? Okay, it's kind of like that. So you can basically follow a little bit of the history of this corruption, if you will, and you read about... I'll read you a little bit about Omri, and a little bit about Ahab, so you can get an idea of why Micah would include this here. So I'm reading from 1 Kings 16, and um, I'm going to read from the NIV for the sake of our listening audience. <laughs> then the people of Israel were split into factions. Half supported Tibni, son of Ginnath, for king. The other half supported Omri. But Omri's followers proved stronger than those of Tibni, son of Ganath. So Tibni died and Omri became king. In the 31st year of Asa, king of Judah, Omri became king of Israel, and he reigned 12 years, six of them in Tirzah. He bought the hill of Samaria from Shemer for two talents of silver and built a city on that hill, calling it Samaria, after Shemer, the name of the former owner of the hill. But Omri did evil in the eyes of the Lord and sinned more than all those before him. So I said, he was bad, but his son's going to be even worse. He walked in all the ways of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and his sin, which he had caused Israel to commit so that they provoked the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger by their worthless idols. So you can kind of initially see why at first Omri and Ahab, of course, will make more sense as we go, why they would be woven in here. The people had basically here in this day and age, Micah's time, departed in every way, shape, and form from serving the living God. And other idols specifically, this is what's interesting, um, and I'll tell you a little bit about Baal and these type of other cult deities in a minute, but became much more important for people then worshiping God, who basically, this is why there's always this reminder, I brought you out of the land of Egypt, I delivered you, I gave you, I did this for you, and this is what you do back to me. This is essentially the verbiage and the dialogue that is had with God to the people. As for the other events in Omri's reign, what he did and the things he achieved, are they not written in the books and annals of the kings of Israel? Omri, Omni, Omri rested with his fathers and was buried in Samaria, and Ahab his son succeeded him as king. 
Now, after Omri dies and uh, Ahab becomes king, we have verse 29, the 38th year of Asa, king of Judah, Ahab, the son of Omri, became king of Israel, reigned in Samaria over Israel 22 years. 22 years, and we have two more years to go. All right. Just trying to put a positive spin on things. Ahab, son of Omri, did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any of those before him. He not only considered it trivial to commit the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, but he also married Jezebel, daughter of Ithbaal, king of the Sidonians, and began to serve Baal and worship him. He set up an altar for Baal in the temple of Baal and he, that he built in Samaria. Ahab also made an Asherah pole and did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than did all the kings of Israel before him. That means extra, extra bad. In Ahab's time, Heel of Bethel rebuilt Jericho, laid its foundations at the cost of his firstborn son Abiram, set up its gates at the cost of his youngest son Sigub, in accordance with the word of the Lord spoken by Joshua, the son of Nun. Remember, to not rebuild the city ever, right? Now, what's interesting, let me just give you a little sidebar on Baal worship. Baal is first attested in the Elba text from about the second half of the second millennium BC, where Baal appears as Ahada or Yahada. And the Ugaritic text, he is clearly the most active and most prominent of all Canaanite deities. He is depicted in the Ugaritic text. This would be extra biblical, outside the Bible. He is depicted as the great storm god, and the fertility of the land depended on the rain provided by this great storm god. You can see a little bit of how people would maybe believe this. Um, in the Outside the Bible, sometimes... Baal is referred to, this is interesting, as the son of Dagon, which if you know the Bible, that's an interesting reference. Um, and Anath is Baal's primary consort. You've also got names like Astart or Ashtoreth, which appears as his consort, but not in the extra uh, biblical text, not as prominent. But in the Old Testament, you'll find this often. I just read that, by the way, um, Baal, and you'll find Baal and Ashtoreth or Asherah, these are always often paired together in the Old Testament. Now, what's also interesting, if you read the Old Testament, there are compound names that occur with the Baal name attached to it, Baal Peor, Baal Hermon, Baal Mian, Baal Hazor, Baal Zebub. So just kind of to get an idea, none of these sound very good, by the way. Um, but you get the idea that this cultic god had more to do with fertility and not just fertility of the land, fertility of the womb, and this kind of goes on. What's interesting is when you get into the Old Testament, there are a number of references to Baals, plural, uh, Judges 2.11, 3.7, and so on. Maybe references to local manifestations or local worships of that same Canaanite deity. Um, there are also some other issues like in Judges. We know, for example, Gideon. It says that he tore down uh, an Asherah grove. There's all kinds of references. You've got to kind of read carefully. But what is very relevant is God is going to send them into a land and they're going to, the children of Israel are going to cohabitate with Canaanite people if they didn't conquer them as they were supposed to who are worshiping these deities. So it's no wonder from the beginning when before God sets them on a course to enter the land that he spells out, thou shall have no other gods before me. I am a jealous God. He spells out the lay of basically what he desires of his people after delivering them. And no wonder that he had to spell this out. They're going to live side by side. You know how easy it is, by the way. Look, I just gave you a reference to something before the message. How easy it is for people to turn a blind eye and say, that's okay, under the guise of tolerance, right? Well, when does it become okay? When your voice is silenced or when syncretistically things become merged and you can no longer discern what is actually 
my belief versus the belief of somebody else because everything does eventually get homogenized. This was God's concern, which is why he said, don't, sorry, don't go with other people from other walks of life or other countries. Stay within your own, and you can, in this day and age, if I say that, I'm not saying it. God said it. Somebody would say, well, that's racist talk. No, that was God saying, I want to preserve a line of people. We're not talking about skin color. We're talking about a line of people that will produce the king of kings. It's all this kind of crazy stuff we live in today that just seems, you know, you can think that this book is such uh, a relic, but in fact, it is a reflection of where we are right now. Because, you know, the people settled into a land, they didn't do what God said, which was to annihilate those people and take them out. And he warned them. And he warned them repeatedly. And if you think the wisest man, Solomon, the man who was basically labeled for his wisdom, he alone by himself couldn't figure this out. That this, we'll call it, um, it's a, a, an unsatiable quest to make sure that I've sampled everything off of the buffet table in terms of religion instead of settling for what, where God put your feet down and recognize that he is God. And all these other things are man-made or they were demonically inspired, but they did not come from God. Now, what's so crazy is that Jezebel, Ahab's wife, she may have actually worshipped a different brand, and I mean this, a different brand of Baal worship, maybe in the form of Melchiart or Molech, but she insisted that her husband basically erect temples and altars to these foreign gods, and he is supposed to be the one leading the people in God's country. You go figure that one out. So not only is Jezebel uh, labeled a terror for that, but something else that she does, which is right in line with what we're looking at, you might say, what does this all have to do with the tea in China? Well, the statutes of Omri, basically his precepts, his ways, which are don't bother making the pilgrimage to Jerusalem, that's too far, like Jeroboam, worship at these idols, it suffices, make your sacrifices here, and by the way, deposit your money here, and whatever it is you're going to do as an offering, because it's not needed in Jerusalem, usurping what God had established. So that's one, and then the works of the house of Ahab are not just that Ahab was a bad king or an evil king. But you've got a very interesting story uh, that happens right under the nose of Ahab. And that is that basically Ahab wants a certain man's vineyard. The man's name is Naboth. His vineyard was very close to the palace, Ahab's palace, and he wants his vineyard. And he says, King Ahab says to Naboth, I would like your vineyard, but I'd like it for a garden like it for an herb garden. And Naboth says, in essence, why would I give up my inheritance to you? Because Naboth seemed like a good, reasonable, God-fearing man. Why would I give up my inheritance to you in giving up my land? Jezebel devises a plan, a very wretched plan. She basically declares some type, some form of a feast um, she conjures up two false witnesses to come against Naboth, charges him with blasphemy against the Lord, and the punishment for that was stoning. You'd die by the death of stoning. She kills an innocent man simply to get the vineyard for her husband. Nice, huh? But I want you to think of that in the setting of what was going on in the city in Micah's day. And that's why he says the works of the house of Ahab. Not only was Ahab an idol worshiper, not only did he let his wife rule the roost. You think that the modern day go girl, girl power thing is something that just popped up? No, Jezebel is probably the queen of that. She probably, she probably wore the pants in that house, no doubt oh, I'll tell you how I'm going to do this. And you're, she probably abased him and figured out how 
when conjuring up this plan. We know what happened to her. You know, most people know the scripture that says Jezebel painted her face with makeup and looked out a window, and that becomes the text for stupid people who don't know that that is not an admonition against women wearing makeup. She was puffed up in pride, thinking her sins would never catch up with her. She was above the law. This is exactly what Micah is decreeing to the people of the city. You are not above the law. Consequences will fall on you. Consequences fell to Jezebel. You know what happened? Jehu, who was to be king, basically shows up and he looks up when he sees her in the window looking out. And she was tended by, she had servants that were eunuchs. That's a very popular thing for women of the house to be tended by eunuchs. Basically, he told them to throw her out the window. And they did. Yay! But then they went out to find her because he said, well, I should at least bury her. But all they could find is a few pieces of her because maybe the dogs had come and eaten up the rest of her. And they had probably had bad indigestion. <laughs> but anyway, you've got in between this, though, you've got an interesting, right sandwiched in the middle of all this, you've got an interesting thing that happens with the prophet Elijah and the prophets of Baal, which is all tied into this, God's way or man's way. You remember that contest on Mount Carmel where Elijah says, basically, we'll see who is God, whose God is real. Is, is, are the God, the prophets of Baal, is Baal real or is God real? And he basically commands that two bulls should be brought, cut into pieces. And the prophets of Baal basically cried out to their God for hours on end. The silence from their God or gods drove them mad. And when it was Elijah's turn, he had to kind of roll up his sleeves and show him off a bit. I love this part. Not only did he put the cut up bull on the altar, but he placed the 12 stones and he bore a kind of a, a hole around the altar and filled it with water. And when he called down, fire from heaven consumed everything, the bull, the rocks, the water, everything. And you know, if you've been here long enough, you can't tell this story without hearing the voice that said, where did they get the water? Just had to put that in for gratuitous sake here. But that was a demonstration that God is God and that everything else is kind of make-believe. And you know what happened? Some people say that's brutal, but Elijah basically sees to it that the prophets of Baal are wiped out. They're killed. And he flees to the desert under a juniper tree for fear of his life from all of all people before she's killed, Jezebel. So you've got a whole kind of we'll call it a whole bunch of vignettes that depict the evil nature and the leaning on these false idols and the leaning on and pursuit of desiring to have another man's property and to have another man's goods, the greed. And this is exactly what Micah is referring to when he says now, let me read it again, for the statutes of Omri are kept, which is basically idol worship or false worship, and all the works of the house of Ahab, and you walk in their counsels. This being said, not just the evil of Ahab himself, but of his wife and of his household. And I just gave you that in a nutshell, but go back in your own time and read the whole story. And you realize that what is being said here is a powerful message being sent to the people. If Trust me, the people in his day knew about Omri and Ahab. They knew what that meant. But it'd be like to, in today's society, if you called somebody a Corinthian, they probably wouldn't know what that means. That was an insult in the New Testament time to be called a Corinthian because that meant that you were basically empty. You only cared about certain spiritual things, but not really too much about the big picture. So it's basically just a big, this we'll, talk, we'll say from verses 9 all the way down to 16, is not only the indictment and the accusation and the judgment that will come but uh, read the last portion here therefore you shall bear the reproach of my people it's all going to fall on you 
Now I realize that there are going to be people who will hear this message and say, well, how could you, if you were part of that city and you didn't know any better? You know how people like to plead ignorant? They say, well, I didn't know any better. Well, maybe the people in that day had an excuse, but in today's society, we're without excuse. You can't claim ignorance anymore. We live in an information society. Unfortunately, a lot of the information is not true and is uh, propagandized for certain agendas. But we live in a society, in a day and age, where we're able to educate ourselves. We're able to know. We, we're able to know what is it that God desires. And you go back to that verse 8, and he says, He has showed thee what, O oh man, what is good, what the Lord doth require of thee, but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. And basically, what is being ripped away in Micah's day is no different than what is being ripped away today, except slightly different color to it. See, if you think about it, all the things that stem from God, what God gives us in his blessings, in his provisions, what God gives us as a sound mind or the ability to look to him. And people could say, well, that's just not enough for me. I need something to touch. I need something to worship at that I can feel or that can, can, I can feel it sees me. And this is the genesis, as I said, if you are a person who likes ecclesiastical history, go back and almost from the beginning of church history, you will see people were trying to import things into the church that they could, they could touch because it wasn't enough to say, excuse me for saying it like this, but the invisible God, the God that we cannot see, but that is omnipresent, that is omnipotent, that is here. This is why the Bible says where two or three are gathered in my name, but people couldn't see that in that day. People are still blind to this in this day. I'm wondering, what is it going to take for people to realize we are just like that? In many ways, the people, the indictment of the people of Micah's day and I'm not suggesting people of the book and people who are faithing. But take a look at what's going on around us. And you can hardly, it would be impossible to not make the connection and say, we have a society that has departed from God's ways. In Micah's day, they departed from God's ways and it was the downfall and the demise. But at least God then was warning them. He gave them a warning. He said, Basically, not necessarily here, but through diverse prophets, turn back to God. It's never too late. Turn back to God until it was too late. And in God's mercy, twice, at least in two different times, in two different periods, carried away the people into captivity. And as I've said many times, those who returned, the people who stayed in, in the land of captivity, they were in different they didn't care, but the people that came back, especially when you go back and you reread the book of Nehemiah and Ezra and you see through the prophets Haggai and Zechariah, how there were people that were more concerned about God and God's ways and God's house and God's word above anything else. Now in this day and age, it appears foolish. It appears archaic. Uh, people, it's, it's an afterthought. Church is something, as I said, and you've heard me probably ad nauseum say this, people look to the church as an entertainment center. Do you see now why I am repulsed by that? Because it could never be an entertainment center for people who are concerned about these times we live in, concerned about their soul, their destiny, about the world we live in, about the future, not just of this country, but of what we call planet Earth and the people who live on it. It's impossible to be that detached and to be that non-caring and to recognize that all this sounds really terrible. If you read into the seventh chapter and he says, woe is me, uh, I'll tell you what, that chapter starts out with a little bit of what I believe God thinks of this land right now when he says, uh, for I am as when they have gathered the summer fruits as the grape, grape gleanings of the vintage. There's no cluster to eat. My soul desireth first ripe fruit. Imagine planting a vineyard, planting a garden, but specifically, let's go to the vineyard. And after a set time, expecting there to be fruit 
and there is nothing. There is no fruit to satisfy the soul. There is no fruit to glean. There is no fruit for anything. Think of fruit as in what is offered up to God from a byproduct of the Spirit abiding in us. Think of it that way. Think of the times we live in now. We are living in an empty vineyard, almost empty, with very little fruit that God can see that's offered up to him. And the fruit that is offered up many times is offered up as our own works of my hand has done this, not look what God hath wrought. So this is not just an admonition, by the way, to Micah's time and Micah's day. It's an admonition for anybody in the sound of my voice to stop. I said this last week. Take a spiritual inventory. Ask yourself the question. It's not for us to live a perfect life. That's never going to happen. It's like the people that say, well, I can live by the law. No, you can't. Nobody could. And even the most just, even the most upright man couldn't live by God's law if he tried. But God's not looking for that. He's looking for people to take him at his word. And this whole chapter, I could sift this down into just a few words. God was still looking in Micah's day for people to turn back to him, to turn away from their greed, from their corruption, from their desire to sample the smorgasbord of everything that's out there, to turn back to him. He gave them an opportunity. Now, we're living in a dispensation of grace. And God is still giving us the chance to turn back. He's giving a chance to this nation to turn back. Part of the problem of that turning back, by the way, is having to acknowledge on the person's part that they've strayed, that they were wrong in their thinking, that they have departed from the right way. You remember back in two chapters back where it says they, they, love, they love the evil and they hate the good. That's where we're at as a society in this day and age. When you think about it, all the topics that are being addressed, and unfortunately, Micah is addressing, we'll, we'll call it the leaders, but it trickles all the way down. When you think about it, when people are walking around now talking about subjects that for decades now we've, ha we've grappled with, we've had issues with, but instead of talking about them in a way that looks back to God's word or at least looks to some foundational pillars of, if you want to call it the Judeo-Christian way, we're looking to homogenize and please everybody because God forbid we should piss somebody off by saying, this is the way, walk ye in it. God forbid there should be an act of discipline on God's part, and there will be one. That is what is coming up. I'll tell you something. I've said this for years. When I say we're living in the last days, and I don't know if the last days are, are a generation, a decade, if it's more or less, is it 500 years, is it 50 years? I can't say I'm not the owner of time. But when you think about it, we are living in the last days when people are basically saying, this is unimportant, life is unimportant, children are unimportant, love and mercy are unimportant, the right and the law is unimportant. Do you see what I'm saying when I say it all, it, it was all there at the beginning it hasn't gotten, gone away. It's just gotten infinitely worse. So what can we do? Standing, I'm standing here in front of you today. I'm one part frustrated, one part angry, one part in disbelief of the times we're living in. But I've said this to you and I'll say it again. I look unto him who is the author of faith. I take him at his word. When he says... There will come a day when he says, in that day, my vengeance will be poured out. I have to believe that all those who have collaborated in the demise of our youth and the demise of our education system and the demise of our law enforcement and the demise of everything that could have been good and wonderful, there will be a day for those people to pay a price. Now, like everybody else, somebody can turn, and we don't know who turns and who repents before time is up. That's not for me to say. But there is a clarion call right now for people to wake up and to get back to the roots, to figure out 
God didn't just say, here, I'm going to give you a couple of ideas and you go figure out how to do them. He said, I gave you a roadmap in this book. This is my last will and testament to you from old to new. There is no addition to this. There isn't some uh, magical plates that were unearthed by Joseph Smith to add to this book. This is the book, old and new. There is one book, one revelation. Walk through these pages and figure out if I'm an unjust God, if I'm unfair, if I don't care for my creation, if I haven't provided mercy and justice and given a law which now has morphed into the law of this land, which, by the way, goes back to the Constitution and things that protect the citizens and the rights and the right to worship freely and to have the ability to say, I, maybe not you, maybe not the listening audience, maybe somebody follows something else, but I, Follow the Lord God in his ways and in his word, not perfectly. I'm not perfect. I fail every day. I'm a sinner saved by grace. But I follow what's in this book, realizing God knows better than I do what's, what's good for me and what's good for this land and what's good for these people. Just like Micah's day, we're no different. The question is, will we heed the warning? Will people out there actually listen and think, my God, we are no different than these, and they were being warned about their demise. How much time is left? I don't know, and I'm not an evangelist trying to scare people. I'm just saying, how much time is left? I don't know. But instead of wasting the time, redeem the time. This is what Paul says in the book of Ephesians, redeem the time. Why? Because we're living in evil times. Look to him, learn his ways. Start eternity now by recognizing he is God He's got a great plan for you. His plans are not of malice or to bring you down. His plans are for good. Follow the designs and maybe figure out that if we all got back to that place, not necessarily perfectly, but looking that direction, we might find the order that he designed from the beginning once more. And I'm not saying we'll have like some lunatic people, well, have peace on earth. No, we will in a future time. But right now we could have peace that comes from him who said, peace, my peace be with you, the Lord Jesus Christ, the final word of it all. And when he said, I'm the Alpha and the Omega, he didn't say, try and figure out what's in between. He said, this is who I am. Now you figure out if I'm enough for you, follow me, not me, Jesus. That's my message. You've been watching me, Pastor Melissa Scott, live from Glendale, California at Faith Center. If you would like to attend the service with us Sunday morning at 11 a.m., simply call 1-800-338-3030 to receive your pass. If you'd like more teaching and you'd like to go straight to our website, the address is www.pastormelissascott.com.